I'm sure you have heard of the Ford SVT Raptor. The Raptor was the first high performance off-road super truck that you could buy straight from the dealership. Not only that, this truck was capable of tackling the Baja 1000 in stock form. The Baja 1000 is like the toughest race ever. So today, we're going to talk about the Le Mans tested and Baja beaten powertrain, the race ready suspension, and all the technology that keeps this prehistoric powerhouse ahead of its time. There are two generations of the Ford Raptor R with slightly different names. The first generation is the Ford SVT Raptor R, which Ford ran from 2010 to 2014, while the second generation called the Ford Raptor Race Truck, and it started its run in 2017. And in either iteration, they were both built and tested through the world of off-road racing, namely the Baja 1000. Put it this way, on average, 40% of all vehicles that start this race, they don't finish. And that's mainly made up of rigs that are specifically built for this race. The only differences between the current gen Raptor, the one you could go to a Ford dealership and buy right now, and the Raptor race truck are all based on race regulations. So today's Raptor race truck gets a roll cage, it gets racing seats, it gets a race spec fuel cell, a race spec navigation system, and it gets three inches of lift to the suspension. But that's it. So you can go to a dealership and buy basically a freaking Baja 1000 tested race truck. The Gen 1 was powered by a big old bossy boy 6.2 liter naturally aspirated V8. And internally Ford referred to this engine as the Boss V8. The Boss V8 was the main variant of what Ford called their modular engine format, which is a big old lovable, huggable family of V8 and V10 small block engines in both single and dual overhead cam orientations. And the Gen 1's engine has a single overhead cam setup with two valves per cylinder, as well as two spark plugs per cylinder. And it was fitted with two spark plugs for a couple of reasons. Now first, Ford wanted to build in redundancy for this engine. Now imagine racing through the desert, it's 3 a.m. in the morning, you're in the middle of nowhere, it's freaking cold outside, the only person around is your co-driver, and he might be sleeping because it's 3 a.m. in the morning. That is the last place you want to be having engine problems and then end up stranded. No thank you, I don't want that. So Ford engineered two spark plugs into the cylinder, that way if one of them failed, they had a backup one, and that backup one was completely independent of the first. Now the second reason that Ford used a dual spark setup was for something called flame propagation. With a larger bore and a shorter stroke, which are common characteristics of small block engines, there's a large volume of space for the fuel air mixture to fill up in a very short amount of time. And when you're at higher RPMs, like the Raptor's redline of 5700 RPM, that air fuel mixture may not get fully ignited before the exhaust valve opens and it gets pushed out. The engine is moving so fast that it's beating the combustion of the fuel. Just think about that as well. So to combat this issue, the dual spark plug setup fires from both corners of the cylinder, thereby creating a much more even and efficient combustion. And this is called flame propagation. And it ensures that the entire mixture gets completely ignited before the cycle completes. Ford mated that Boss V8 to their six-speed automatic transmission, and then they called it a day. And the net result of all that in the Gen 1, it has a large capacity, small size, high power, low emissions, super reliable powertrain. And in fact, its engine was such a massive success that after the truck finished third in its class during its first time at the Baja 1000, a class in which five out of the nine vehicles that entered the race didn't even finish, Ford took that engine and they made it the standard one inside the regular Ford Raptor. You've heard that old saying before, what gets third place on Sunday gets leased on Monday. I would lease a Raptor, not even lying, I thought about buying a Raptor when I bought my F-150. But I was like, do I really need a Raptor? I mean, I don't, but I do. So where did Ford go from there? Did they use a bigger engine? Did they use turbos? Did they use a supercharger? Well, they went from a V8 to a V6, and they went from a naturally aspirated to a twin turbocharged setup. Woo-wee, where are my boost creep boys at? 
Oh, I'm not wearing my Boost Creep shirt. The Gen 2 actually has the same engine, albeit with some different tuning that was developed for the 2017 Ford GT supercar, which also won the 24 Hours of Le Mans in its very first appearance in that race. That's pretty impressive stuff from a V6. So the Gen 2's EcoBoost engine, it's called the D35, is obviously a far departure from the Boss V8. Aside from it being a V6, it also uses dual overhead cams. Now the EcoBoost also has a couple of spinny boys bolted on that use specifically designed extra lightweight turbines and something called electronically actuated wastegates. Now a wastegate is basically a bypass valve for exhaust gases to circumvent the turbocharger which allows for the amount of exhaust that's spinning up the turbine to be regulated. It does this by having a set amount of pressure that the wastegate can withstand before it opens up and bypasses the turbine, going straight to the exhaust or into the atmosphere. A wastegate typically gets this pressure from the compressor or the cold side of the turbocharger. The D35's electronically actuated wastegate constantly takes readings from the throttle input, engine load, and RPM, and uses this data to not only control whether or not the wastegate is open, but how much it will open up. This automatically controls the boost pressure, giving the absolute peak performance to the wheels at any speed or RPM. The D35 also incorporates direct injection and port injection for the fuel to get to the cylinders. Now you might be asking yourself, Jerry Berry, why the heck would I need to use two kinds of fuel injection methods and only one engine? Well, that's a very good question and we're going to figure this out together. The difference between the two is that direct fuel injection goes straight into the cylinder while port injection mixes fuel and air upstream from the intake valve. We've mentioned the different types of fuel injection before, so if you want to learn more about that, go check out this episode on the Subaru WRX SGI. Go into it a little bit more there if you want to nerd out, it's a good one. The way that the D35 uses both is by prioritizing port injection at lower load and lower RPM, gradually incorporating both injectors as the engine moves through the power band. And then it prioritizes direct injection at higher engine loads and higher RPM. And it's really a smart way to efficiently squeeze the most power out of an engine. Now that D35 links up to the factory 10 speed automatic transmission. And 10 speeds sounds like a lot. And to be honest, it is a lot. But the Gen 2 uses this transmission very cleverly. So they incorporate higher gear ratios in the first set of gears, and that's to make sure that the truck gets a good launch off the line. And then it has progressively lower ratios as the gears go up, with the last few gears just being overdrive gears for super efficient speeds when you're driving on the highway. So the Raptors got a good transmission and a good engine. But if you wanna compete in the Baja 1000, you need more than just a burly powertrain to get you through all 1,000 miles. You need some really sturdy suspension with a lot of travel to make your way through the rough terrain of Baja, Mexico. And that's why the Raptor uses one of the best aftermarket suspension companies in the world, and that is the Fox Shock brand. Now, Fox has been one of the high-performance go-to brands for off-road trucks, motorcycles, and a bunch of other off-road vehicles. So when Ford started pulling the trigger on the Gen 1, it was only a natural decision to put Fox internal bypass shocks on their rig. Shocks generally have three zones in them. They're called the catch zone, the ride zone, and the bump zone. So to help explain these three types of zones, let's say I'm in my Ford Raptor R race truck. I'm driving on the street, right? Right now, I'm in my ride zone. The suspension is under the normal weight of the truck and all the people and stuff that you have inside it. There's a big jump, so the truck takes the jump, and now the suspension is in what's called the catch zone, and that is when the shocks are fully decompressed. So I'm up in the middle of the air, I'm freaking free bird flying in my Raptor R and I land the truck. Well, when I land the truck, the suspension is now in the bump zone. And the bump zone is when the shock gets close to its maximum load. 
The Fox shocks and the Gen 1 are made out of two sleeves of metal with one inside the other. The inside sleeve of the shock has one little hole inside of it towards the bump zone and two holes in the inner sleeve towards the catch zone. And these holes allow for the fluid inside of the suspension to freely flow in between the two sleeves as the shock's piston compresses and decompresses. And this is what keeps the suspension nice and plush and soft. But when the shock goes past the holes and pushes into the bump zone, the suspension becomes much more stiff and more deeply dampened because the fluid can only pass through the compression valve. And that compression valve is built directly into the shock's piston, preventing the truck from bottoming out. Likewise, the exact same process occurs at the top end of the suspension as the shock piston goes into the catch zone. The Gen 2 Raptor took the Fox suspension from the Gen 1 and it added a little yummy maraschino cherry on top. Ford and Fox worked together to develop something called live valve shock absorbers. And the suspension system utilizes sensors that closely monitor braking, steering input, acceleration to actively and continuously adjust the amount of compression and rebound dampening that the internal cylinder can allow for the truck. And these adjustments happen at all four corners of the truck independently. So this keeps the truck much more level on super rough terrain, which ultimately allows it to go faster because it's behaving more predictably. You gotta be one with your truck. You pair all this fancy shock absorber tech with an additional lift to the front and rear suspension and you got yourself a truck that can handle 13 inches of suspension travel up front and 13.9 in the back. Now to put that in perspective, a 2017 F-150 4x4, that's just the non-Raptor version, it has eight inches of suspension travel up front and eight inches out back. Big difference. After the guys at Ford completed the Baja 1000 and the Gen 2, one of the engineers on the team was quoted as saying, no truck with a warranty should be able to do what this truck does. I mean, just think about that for a second. You can go up to 100 miles an hour in the deep sands of Mexico for over 30 hours straight, and then you can still take it back to your dealership and it's covered under a warranty. And they'll probably even wash it for you. Hey guys, just wanna give you a heads up that there will be no bumper to bumper next week. We're taking a week long vacation, so there's not gonna be any donut shows. We're taking a little summer vacay. So if you come to our page next week and you're like, hey, where the heck are these new videos? We're just taking a week off. We're not going anywhere. Bye for now. We'll be back. Better than ever. Say hello to Dolly. Say hello. Hi. My name's Dolly. Say hi. <laughs> you make my life better. We hope we're making yours a little bit better. Bye for now. <laughs>